I pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you could turn with me uh, to the book of Micah. It is one of the minor prophets right before the New Testament. Uh, It is called a minor prophet because it is small, it's short compared to Ezekiel and Isaiah. It doesn't mean it's any less important than the major prophets. And we are going to look at uh, Micah chapter 6 today. So one of the the things that I enjoy, uh, where I work right now, I work in the the building of the chaplain school, and uh, I'm able to see people that I've worked with in the past. They will come through to take different courses and things like that, and I'll get to see old acquaintances that I may have had 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, But the other thing I enjoy is hearing some of the stories. Chaplains, I think some of you here are military or have been in the military, are not really known Um, for uh, being a very good soldier, so to speak. Maybe not having it all together, particularly if you're a new chaplain. You may have been worshiping, leading worship at First Baptist Podunk, Alabama one week, and the next week you're in the Army. They only give you about three months of training before they ship you off to your first duty assignment. Usually a private will even have more uh, time of training than that. I heard a story one time of a a chaplain, a new chaplain, no experience with the army, goes to his first duty assignment. And there are certain protocols, certain things you're supposed to do. And so he goes in to meet his new commander and uh, puts out his hand and said, Hey, Tony, how are you doing? I'm so glad to meet you. I'm your new chaplain. Well, if you are a captain, chaplain, and you are talking to your lieutenant colonel battalion commander, you do not call that person by their first name. That is a no-no. There's a certain way that you are supposed to approach senior officers. And in the same way, God has a way that he wants us to approach him. Not just a desire, but a way that he says it has to be done. And so that's what we're going to look at today uh, in the book of Micah. The background uh, for the book of Micah right here is that it's written about 750 B.C., Isaiah is the king of Judah, and he is an evil king. Um, He is worshiping idols, he's worshiping Baal, and he is allowing corruption to take place. There's really not a whole lot of justice being done in Israel right now. And the culture of Israel and uh, Judah mirrors the hearts of the people. There's violence, there's corruption, there's robbery, There's covetousness, there's gross materialism, people are spiritually bankrupt, illicit sex all over the place, and if you turned on the TV in our culture today, you pretty much see the same thing. So you can imagine what it's like then. So this passage deals specifically with the Israelites forgetting how to come before God. And this is a serious oh, here we go. Micah, chapter 6. I think we have it good on the screen. This is God speaking here. He says, listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember Balak, king of Moab, Plotted, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit 
of my own body for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So, the passage opens up in a courtroom, basically, where God is bringing charge against his people in Israel. God not only is the uh, judge, but he is also the lawyer bringing the accusation. I like the way that uh, Peterson's message transliteration has it. I'm going to read that. It says, Take your stand in court. If you have a complaint, tell it to the mountains. Make your case to the hills. And now, mountains, hear God's case. Listen, jury earth, for I am bringing charges against my people. I am building a case against Israel. I'm not a lawyer, but I would assume that the way that a court case would open up is they would first bring the charge and say, this is why you're in here. We're going to try to find out if you are innocent or guilty. But that's not what God does. God shows a little bit of tenderness, and he kind of puts himself on trial. He says, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? God's saying to his people, what have I done? Am I not a good God? In a way, it's, it's God is making a charge against his people almost uh, for like spiritual adultery, saying, you have left me. You're not in relationship with me anymore. Many of them have gone off to worship false gods at like Baal, just like the king has done. Others still go to the temple but they're just going through the motions. They're offering sacrifices. They're going to church. They're involved in Sunday school. But their heart is far from God. We probably don't consider it often enough. But coming before the Lord in an act of worship is a great privilege. And it's also a great responsibility. In uh, 1 Corinthians, when Paul is uh, talking about how communion is supposed to be offered, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven, 27, he says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. It's an important thing for us to have our hearts right before we come to God in worship, to not just to go through the motions, to not have another uh, idol in our life but to examine our hearts. I think of the, uh, the old hymn, I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We're all prone to wander from God. We're all prone to leave our first love, like it says in the book of Revelation. That's not what God intends for us. It's not what God wants. But the sinners that we are, it will happen. In order for us to come to God in the right way, we'll need to look at our hearts. God's second thing he does after he opens up in the courtroom, again, he doesn't charge the people, but he reminds the people of his deliverance, of his redemption he says, oh, my people, what have I done to you? And have I wearied you? Testify against me. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent before you Moses and Miriam, 
O my people, remember how Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. From Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. He says, I brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you. You were slaves in Egypt, and there was nothing you could do in and of your own power to bring you up out of Egypt. I had to do it. Not only that, but I gave you leadership. I gave you Moses. I gave you Aaron. I gave you Miriam. It's a blessing when God gives us leaders to lead us in our congregation. Nobody's perfect. No leaders are perfect. These people weren't perfect. Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. Moses, if you remember, was not able to enter into the promised land because he got mad. He, he hit the rock twice with a staff to, for water to come out. You think, well, that's not that big of a sin, but listen to what the Lord says. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me, it wasn't because he hit a, hit a rock with a staff, because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I gave them. Aaron, if you remember when Moses went up to Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, what happened down in the valley? The people went back to idolatry. They took their gold, they melted it down to make a calf, and Aaron was in charge of that. Bringing him back into idolatry. And Miriam began to raise a rebellion against Moses and his leadership. And, and God actually... Uh, cast upon her um, leprosy. And until Moses pleaded with God to take it away, she was a leper. God's provision for us and his leadership is a blessing. Our leaders are not perfect, but they're a blessing and a provision from God. Balak, the king of Moab and Balaam, if you look in Numbers 22 through 25, you can see that story. The children of Israel are walking to, into the promised land. And there's hundreds of thousands, a, a great multitude of Israelites. And the Moabites were afraid. What are they going to do to us? But there's so many, the Moabites decided that they could not attack Israel. So the king, Balak, got Balaam, a prophet for hire, so to speak to curse the Israelites. And time and time again, Balaam tried to curse the Israelites. But God refused to allow him to do it. And Balaam had to go back to Balak and said, I can't curse. I can't curse him. God won't let me. The Israelites were under attack. They had an enemy. They didn't even know it. And God was there to protect them. God brought them out of Egypt. God gave them leadership. God protected them even when they didn't uh, know they needed it. From Shittim to Gilgal, from one side of the, uh, of the Jordan River to the other side of the Jordan River, God brought them. God has been faithful. He's the faithful one. We're not the faithful one. God keeps his promises. We don't maintain the relationship with a holy God. The story of the Bible is a story about man's rebelliousness against God and God's continued redemption of bringing people back into relationship with him. We see it with Adam and Eve. We see it in the book of Judges where, where things are going well. People start to, to feel good about themselves and then they start to forget about God, go into sin. God turns them over to their enemy they repent. God sends a judge. They're delivered. They follow God. They get happy. They get comfortable. They fall away from God. A continual cycle again and again and again in the book of Judges. And finally, we think of how the cross is God's redemption of bringing back those uh, who are rebellious against God. Only redeemed people can worship God. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He's reminding them, hey, I redeemed you. I brought you back out of Egypt. 
Romans 8 says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why we must be born again, born of the Spirit, so that we can then honor God, worship God, please God with our lives. It's not about our acts. It's not about what we do. And that's the next thing that the people say. First we had God speaking. Now here's the people. They say, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? God says in the Old Testament that we're supposed to come to him with burnt offerings. Told that to Israel. So yes, they were supposed to do it. A calf a year old, that's, that's more expensive than a newborn calf because you have to invest a year of taking care of that, that calf. Shall I come? Would it be pleasing to you if I had a thousand rams? That's worth way more than one calf. It keeps up and and up. And how about 10,000 rivers of olive oil? That's unspeakable. Nobody could have that much. I can give you even what I don't have, God. Is that what you want? How about this? If I give you my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my own body for the sin of my soul. Part of Baal worship was burning alive your child, your infant child. They would have an altar that would look like Baal with his hands up like this, and they would get it hot, and you would place your baby on there and let it fry. He said, should we even do that? Is that what you want from us, God? To give my firstborn? Will that please you? God gave his only begotten, his only begotten son. If you go back one chapter, this is interesting, go back to chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephraim, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, and one to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, even everlasting. Just in the previous chapter, there's a prophecy about Jesus Christ coming. Our righteousness... Our worship, without having the right heart attitude, is but filthy rags. But on the cross, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we get His righteousness, and He gets our filthy rags. Therefore, when God looks upon us, He doesn't see us and our righteous works that we can't measure up. What He sees is He sees Jesus Christ and His righteousness, because He died in our place. We can't be transformed, but it's through Christ, through His sacrifice, the only begotten Son, that we are transformed. And that's what God wants from us, is a transformed heart. The next passage, verse 8, is oftentimes taken out of context. This is not a works-based salvation here. This is not saying, this is what you do in order to be right with God. To be right with God, you have to be redeemed and bought back with God. We saw that in the second part of the scripture that we looked at. God redeemed the people. A redeemed people can then act this way, and this is what is true worship to the Lord. Doing justly. Doing the right thing. You can't do the right thing unless you are righteous. You can't be righteous until you've been made right with God. How do we tell the difference between right and wrong? Our culture is so confused about that. They're calling evil good and good evil. The scripture tells us what's right and what's wrong. When I was growing up, I would ask my mom and my dad, Why? Why do I have to do that? You know what their answer was? Because I said so. Right? You probably have said that to your kids as well if you have kids. But that's not what God says. He doesn't say because I said so. 
He says, because I am. The commandments in the Bible, the morality that's in the Bible is not based just because God said so. It's based on who he is. It's based on God's character. And that's how we are to live our lives, based on God's character, to reflect God to an ungodly world, to represent him here. What would God do to us if he was to act justly? We've sinned against him. If there's a penalty to be paid, we have to pay it, right? There would be hell and there would be damnation. But part of God's character, too, is mercy. It says, do, just, do justly and love mercy. Some, some versions say kindness. I looked it up, and the, the, word, the, the Hebrew word is translated Kindness about a quarter of the time and mercy about three quarters of the time. But the connotation there is not just to be kind to somebody, but it's to be kind to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Kind to somebody who's mean to you. Not just to be merciful, but to love it. God is just and God is merciful. So through the person of Jesus Christ, he is able to show his justice by punishing Christ, but to show his mercy by allowing us to be pardoned in his punishment. Jesus has a few things to say about mercy. Matthew 5, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And uh, one of the stories that Jesus says, one of the parables, he talks about a, uh, a servant who has a debt that he cannot pay. It is too large. And he goes to the master and says, Master, I can't pay the debt. The master says, You're forgiven. The servant goes out and finds one of his buddies, another servant, who has a $100, bet, or $100 debt to the previous servant but can't pay it. And so the first servant who was forgiven says, Take this, this wicked servant and throw him into jail. Then the master called in the first servant and says, You wicked servant, I canceled all the debt that was yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you in anger? His master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he was paid back all he owed, which he could not do. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. One of my favorite movies uh, is the movie Les Mis from Victor Hugo, not the new one where they're singing and everything, but the old black and white one. And uh, one of my favorite scenes in there is uh, where Jean Valjean, who had been released from prison on a probation and is walking through the, the countryside and ends up being taken in by the, uh, the bishop and the bishop's sisters. And they give him soup. They have a very meager life. They give him soup. And uh, that night, he gets up. Uh, and, and while he's eating soup, by the way, he tells, he tells the, the bishop what's going on, that he's been released from prison, that he's now going to be a new man. However, that night, Jean Valjean wakes up, and he goes to the cabinet, and he gets the silverware, real silver, and puts it in his bag. And as he's doing that, he's making a little bit of noise, and the bishop gets up to see what's going on. Well, Jean Valjean beats him to the point of unconsciousness. The next morning, the bishop's out in his garden, and some of the police bring Jean Valjean back in cuffs. I said, did this guy stay with you last night? He says, oh, yes, he did. He says, yeah, we thought so. He's got your silverware here. The bishop knows that Jean Valjean is going to be locked up in prison for the rest of his life or executed because he's on probation and he stole from the bishop. He says, do you know him? He goes, yes, of course. Did you have this silverware? He says, I gave it to him. But then he looks at Jean Valjean and says, but why didn't you take the silver candlesticks as well? They're worth 2,000 francs at least. 
Thank you for bringing him back to me. I'm very relieved. And he, the, the, the police leave. The bishop looks at Jean Valjean and says, Don't forget. Don't ever forget. You promised to become a new man. Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil. With this silver, I purchase your soul. I ransom you from fear and hatred, and now I give you back to God. Not the best theology, right? But it's a great story to show mercy. The bishop was beaten. The bishop had stuff stolen from him. When he was returned, rather than have the evil that was placed upon him to be justified, he gave mercy. Not only that, he gave him more. He gave him the candlesticks as well and said, now go change. Be a good man. Make no judgment where you have no compassion. How much have you been forgiven? How much are you supposed to forgive? And last, it says to walk humbly with your God. If we are walking humbly with our God, we're going to be able to do justly. We're going to be able to love mercy. Walking depicts a journey. It's traveling at the same pace with somebody else. As we're walking with God through the journey of our lives, we're to walk humbly with him, to submit to his authority. We're created for a relationship with God. He wants us to walk humbly with him through this life. It's not a works-based salvation. It's about having a right heart with God, the right relationship with God. It's a result of being redeemed by God, doing something that we can't do. Our redeemed life is to represent Christ here on earth. Justice, mercy, walking humbly with God, to glorify them so that others can see His greatness in our lives. Through His redemption, we're able to worship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for calling us to love you, to be in relationship with you, to worship you. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody here today who has not been redeemed, who has not been brought back, that does not have the heart change that you want to give us, that that, that could take place today. And for those of us, Lord, who have been redeemed, who are your children. Lord, help us to take a look in our hearts and see what's really going on. See, um, Lord, how we can truly worship you in our lives, not just here in church, that's important, but also when we leave these walls, how we can do justly, love mercy, and be merciful to other people. Lord, and continue to walk humbly with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.